The Apollo Detectives are a YouTube channel that like to try and debunk and disprove the Apollo moon landings. They are adamant that we didn't go to the moon. So when I saw that they were reviewing the upcoming Artemis 2 mission, I simply had to have a look. <laughs> Hello all and welcome along to another episode of Tin Fall Tuesday with me, Simon Dan. Thanks very much for joining me. Before we begin with today's video though, I was reading earlier how Japan have successfully launched a new cargo spacecraft to deliver supplies to the International Space Station and I was reading that story on Ground News, which was actually founded by a former NASA engineer called Harleen Kaur who worked on the James Webb Space Telescope. Now Ground News combines stories and articles from thousands of outlets local and national in one place so readers can see the full picture of what's being reported around the world. As you can see here, Ground News shows you if there's any political leanings for each publication. And in this instance with the new Japanese spacecraft we can see that it's mainly centre driven with 48 total news sources. Now for every story you get a quick visual breakdown of the news outlet covering it, what their political bias is, how factual the source is, which entity owns that source and which countries are covering the story. Now, Ground News is also gaining notoriety for its work. They were recently recognised by the Nobel Peace Centre for their impact on media literacy, saying it's an excellent way to stay informed, avoid echo chambers and expand your worldview, which is exactly why we use Ground News as well. You can see every side of every story with international perspectives that are hard to find, so then you can make informed decisions where you can read, watch and share the best information available. Also, Ground News is mission centric. It's not about eliminating bias, but providing better transparency. Plus, they're funded by the community, not by big ads or investors. So go to ground.news slash Simon to stay fully informed on breaking news and compare media coverage Subscribe through my link for 40% off unlimited access if you support the mission and find it as useful as I do. Thanks again to Ground News. Right then, on with today's video, which as I said in the intro, uh, features the Apollo detectives and they're reviewing the upcoming Artemis 2 mission from NASA. I do wonder what they think of it and whether it will actually go to the moon. Let's have a look. Well friends, today we start out with the Artemis 2 missions. We're going to cover about 15 to 17 questions that were asked by people who called in. What sort of questions were being asked? The very first question that was asked was, how long is it going to take for you to get there? Well, in Apollo 11, we all know that it took, what, three days? Yeah, three days. Well, they're going to give a reason why it's going to take longer than that. Because I got to refuel on the way. <laughs> Sorry. I realise he's being flippant here, but just for clarity, Artemis is not Apollo 11 2.0. It is a test flight. The crew won't land. They'll loop around the moon to test propulsion, life support systems and the comm system. Now it takes longer than Apollo 11 because the flight path is different, not because they're running out of fuel. Orion is powered by solar arrays, not by a rocket that needs topping up mid-flight. No. <laughs> Well, that's the SLS system for you, but we don't know because they're not talking about that much here. And don't forget, this is Artemis 2. It's only going around the moon. And then one of the other questions was this. Is this a repeat of Apollo 8? Apollo 8 did this 57 years ago or close to it. And the only difference I can see is that it's going to take twice as long to get there. <laughs> what was their answer to that question? Because that would have been my question. So the lady's going on about the LCC, something like that, and how the configuration is different from that of Apollo. Oh, and that it is a less risk reduction. How can that be a less of a risk reduction when you haven't sent people around the moon since Apollo 8, as far as we're concerned? Assuming they sent them then when they said they did. Apollo 8 proved that humans could orbit the moon. Artemis 2 is proving that an entire new spacecraft can do it safely. Different rocket, different hardware, different systems. Everything from guidance to life support has been redesigned. That's why NASA is calling it a risk reduction mission. You don't send people straight to the lunar surface on a ship you've never flown before. You test it first. That's how you reduce the risk. Then there's a question about Mars. Well, why don't we try making it to the moon first, guys, before we go on any fantasy runs about Mars? And then one of the call-in questions, the lady's talking about the SLS system, specifically the solid booster rockets. 
So she's going on about this spectacular failure that we saw with the solid rocket motor exploding. Then the lady representing them said that it was a new design and that they had to test it. So she's going on about new technology, that's the first thing, that they redesigned the boosters and that it has all been repaired. Oh, that's good news, he said ironically. The SLS boosters are upgraded versions of the Space Shuttle ones. Now NASA pushed them harder, found an issue during testing and then fixed it. That's how every safe rocket program in history works. Test, learn, repair, repeat. The whole point is to find the failures before humans ride it. <laughs> then we get to this other question. Have you repaired the heat shield yet? That's a good question, because they haven't said they've repaired it yet. So this lady in the audience is asking them about the heat shield and the performance, and how they solved the problem with the first heat shield on Orion. And then he's asking them, have you solved the problems with the heat shield on Artemis 1? Because it was also burned. December 2014, that was the first one, first Orion test. It's when the heat shield nearly packed in. Well, the way the panel is answering all of these questions is the same old story. It's all been fixed. We solved the problems. The Orion heat shield didn't nearly pack in. It performed within safety limits, but showed more charring and flaking than expected. Now, NASA studied the data, they found the cause, it was material ablation patterns, and then they made improvements for Artemis II. Now, if you ask me, that's progress, not failure. So when NASA said they solved the problem, that's not brushing it off. They're saying they solved the problem. Out of 17 questions, not one person brought up the question about radiation. Really? Not one? Not one. I thought that would be the first question. How do you protect the astronauts from the radiation? Should have been the question. Maybe they were told not to ask about it. Radiation isn't a secret. It's one of the most studied aspects of space travel. NASA have discussed it publicly for decades. Artemis II will pass through the Van Allen belts quite quickly in about an hour limiting exposure to below harmful levels. The Orion spacecraft also has dedicated radiation shielding, and the crew will have dosimeters to monitor exposure in real time. So there's no gag order going on here. It just wasn't asked because the topic's been explained multiple times. Presumably there was no question about vacuum. Oh, heck no. No, of course not. And the effect that the vacuum might have on the equipment NASA doesn't need to guess what the vacuum of space does to their equipment. Every single component on Orion, the SLS system and the spacesuits have all been vacuum tested here on Earth. We've been doing that since the 1960s. The Apollo hardware was tested that way and so will Artemis's be. So no, the vacuum of space isn't some mysterious death zone for technology. It's a routine engineering condition that's been managed for over half a century. This is question number nine from a reporter from Spaceflight magazine. Now he's talking about the emergency egress system and whether they're going to do a shakedown of it, including the astronauts escaping from that command capsule down the trolley on those wires that takes them to safety. One basket hanging off the escape ropes, I believe there's three baskets side by side. So if there's a problem, the astronauts get out of the capsule they get into the basket, and then they go down the wire to safety. Well, if the rocket explodes, you're not going to have time to get out of that, are you? Because the escape system, the rockets on the top are going to fire, and they're going to take you to safety. So why would you have that? Oh, wait a minute, that's for the crew to go down. But what they fail to realize is that if that rocket explodes, the whole tower's coming down. I don't think they realize that. No, I don't think they do. They're mixing up two completely different safety systems here. The launch abort system, the rocket tower on top, is for emergencies after liftoff. If something goes wrong, these rockets can pull the crew capsule away instantly. And they're confusing that with the egress baskets. These are for ground evacuations, say if there's a fuel leak or fire before launch. Two systems, two different scenarios. Neither of them involves waiting around under a giant exploding rocket. NASA's risk procedures are far more thought out than that. Let's take a look at the N1 rocket. When that thing exploded, people half a mile away were lighting up like matchsticks. Yep. So to me, the question this guy's asking about how they tested it seems to be irrelevant. It is. Totally irrelevant. Irrelevant? 
It's the opposite of irrelevant. If there's a fire, for example, on the pad before launch, then the egress system would work perfectly. So now we come to question 10, and he's asking the question about the SRB, the solid rocket booster, and he says this. Did that prompt you to do any tests or safety analysis before you strapped that onto the Artemis II rocket with the capsule on top? Then the lady answering says, we confirm that there is a difference in the configuration between the two different booster types, and that problem has been solved now. So that's the second question that they've asked about those boosters. Right, because there is a difference and it has been solved. The Artemis 1 boosters were the first full-scale test of the SLS system. After that, the engineers analysed every second of data. They found a few minor structural stress points and then made upgrades for Artemis 2. Here's a good one. With the 10 days being out there and the dangers encountered, how are you going to bring the public along? How many times have we seen that in the past? You get one cam review, one on the inside of the dummy piloting the command module, and the other one outside looking at the moon, and the moon looks like Swiss cheese. So, are you guys going to have more cameras in there, or are you going to have three cameras, four cameras, five cameras? How many cameras are you going to have? Because we've seen what happened last time. You had one camera inside, and you had one camera outside, that's what it looks like to us, and we never got to see the rest of them. It's going to be interesting to see what they do. How many cameras are they going to have in there? Well, they don't really say. And then she asks, what type of cameras are they? How many cameras are you going to use? How many are you going to have on the exterior, on the interior? They don't say. It sounds to me like they're a bunch of politicians going off on a tangent, never answering the question. Yeah, yeah they don't answer the question. Not to the extent that you'd expect them to answer it. Artemis 2 will carry multiple internal and external cameras, including HD and 4K systems built into the Orion capsule and the European service module. NASA have even released mock-ups for where they'll be mounted during the live streams. This isn't Apollo era one grainy camera. The technology has massively improved since then. But Mission Control won't list every single camera before launch because those details can change right up to integration. I don't know about you, but if I were an astronaut going on a trip like that, the thing that I would be concerned about would be the radiation. Yeah. It appears to me that this question is not being asked here, or it's being avoided. No. And this is 44 minutes and 59 seconds worth of questions, which was opened up to the audience, the press, and people on the telephone. You could ask any question, and out of 17 questions, not one question about radiation came up to that panel. That's not very good. That's not showing NASA are taking care of their astronauts. Because if they haven't provided the information about the radiation levels beyond the Van Allen belt, not in them, beyond them, the astronauts probably don't know either, otherwise they'd have chipped in and answered it. But they haven't. Radiation isn't being ignored, as I've already said, it's being actively measured. Orion already carried radiation sensors on Artemis 1, collecting real-time data beyond the Van Allen belts. These results have been published, you can literally read them online. And the Artemis 2 crew? They've been fully briefed and trained on radiation safety. The spacecraft even has storm shelter zones, designed for solar flare protection. This is what annoys me about channels like Apollo Detectives. The information they are questioning is already published everywhere. If they just spent some time looking at that, they wouldn't have had to make this video. I, for one, am desperately excited about Artemis 2. I cannot wait for it to shut up those space deniers. And I think that's where we're going to leave it for today. Please do let me know in the comments what you thought of this video from the Apollo Detectives, as I say we're all done and dusted for another one. Thanks so much for watching today, as ever it's appreciated. If you enjoyed it, please do consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the thumbs up button too. Just enough time to once again thank Ground News for sponsoring today's video. Remember, go to ground.news slash Simon, stay fully informed on breaking news and compare media coverage. Click the link in the description to get 40% off unlimited access if you support the mission and find it as useful as I do. I've been Simon Dan, have yourselves a great day, and I'll see you tomorrow for the flat earther called Iron Horse, who's making more mistakes again. See you then.